Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, where weather is always our theme, but weather forecast, eh, maybe go somewhere else for that. Now, I hope you've been having an enjoyable weather week since we last talked. I know one of my favorite podcasters, Father Roderick, priest over in the Netherlands, had snow. And you know me, I love snow. And he was also had a new DSLR camera, so a couple things of interest to me. And he was out testing that, working with that. And, you know, it's one of those things. It was cold, it was snowy, and in some occasions, he may not be real happy about that. But he seemed to really be enjoying testing out the new camera and trying it out with some of the different scenes. And, you know, winter winter pictures always are very enjoyable, even if the weather outside makes you want to go back inside for some people. Not, not so much for me, but I don't know. It, it still sets a mood. It, you know, it invokes different times and sensations for all of us but hopefully most of them are positive for those of you that do get to enjoy snow if you want to check out his work of course check out tridio.com it's like video except with a tr instead of a v so of course look that up the other thing i saw that caught my eye this week was something that was announced at the annual ams meeting which i've mentioned in a couple episodes recently something called the alliance for Integrative Approaches to Extreme Environmental Events. Now, I had to get past the acronym. You know, it seemed like it would be a long one. It reminded me more of something like the American Dodgeball Association of America. So I'm not sure they're going to go by AIAEEE or if they've got some sort of other acronym that I'm, I'm not seeing in all this. But putting that aside for a moment, the interesting thing is this group has funding, which a lot of these things don't, and have a lot of very... Um, involve stakeholders and it, it looks really neat so I will put a link in the show notes if this kind of stuff interests you but it always does for me and it, you know even with the concept of what we talk about here at the show I think it's important so often when we we look towards the future that we focus not only on what we think is going to happen scientifically but how we're going to deal with with those components. So whether you're looking, you know, just the next year, maybe the forthcoming hurricane season, or if you're looking more long term, when we see these sort of extreme events in in the world in which we live today, which has become more populous, of course, and how they can have such major impacts on so many people, I think understanding and having multiple disciplines talking to one another is a very, very important thing. So I hope they have some successes. And if it, like I said, if it's something of interest to you, certainly check out the show notes and give the Alliance a look and, and see what they're up to. So they, they put together a website, not a lot there yet, but you know, they're really still just kind of getting off the ground. Now, our main story this week is your smartphone, the future of weather forecasting. Let you ponder that for a moment. And you've heard me talk in some past episodes about kind of that connection and some of the ways that, you know, certainly our modern tech is involved in the weather forecasting process and how it's changed. And, you know, we've talked big data and some other things like that. But I really wanted to speak to this individual device. For those that, you know, have had mobile phone, I mean, we, they're not, it's not a new device, right? I mean, I can remember my first so-called mobile phone was what we would call a bag phone, right? It was it was actually kind of a, it's almost like a purse type thing. The battery was huge and it didn't last all that long. And you took this thing and, you know, carried it around. Um, but, you know, once you unplugged it from a power source, you maybe got, I don't know, an hour's worth of airtime, you know, before you had to have it plugged back in. So certainly, Mobile devices have come a long way, and we've seen them, right? They went from these big sort of things to something certainly more compact, but still kind of felt maybe like some of the hands-free phones or, you know, small handset phones that were in the homes at the time, you know, when they, the home kind of went to the wireless communication type of phone. Then we went to these devices that had a little bit more capability, you know, it was maybe the BlackBerry age where text messages could be sent. And we started to get things sent to those devices, Some maybe some simple weather forecast, because there were a few apps out there. A lot of the stuff was still built into the devices. And then we got into, you know, some of the more modern phones. But smartphone might still be a, a reach at that point. But had a few apps and had ways to, again, kind of get that weather forecast. 
but certainly where we are now, it's a, a very different sort of era. Now, along those same lines, you know, I would say probably from the mid 2000s, maybe even the early 2000s, we also saw this age of, of the PDAs or the personal digital assistants, so Palm Pilots. And I know I had a, a Palm 3, if I remember correctly, and then a Dell Axiom. So we moved into the color age. And I still remember I had this, this Dell handheld and I had loaded all sorts of weather apps and was getting my radar images on there and everything. Now, most people weren't doing that, but there were finally apps that were showing more weather information or providing that information. But really, it was when we moved to the smartphone, and, and I would really say the PDA became part of the mobile phone. I mean, that was really the merger that took place. And so we had this smartphone device. And in this day and age, in a lot of ways, it's really not even a phone in a lot of times when we're using it. So many people today hardly even use the phone capability. So it's really more of a smart device. Now, initially, again, the focus was on pushing information to that device. But as these devices have evolved and they can handle more processing on them and get data almost always real time, you know, again, in the beginning with these devices, we had these rate limited plans and weren't necessarily working well going from Wi-Fi back to being on the mobile network. But most of those issues have been resolved and most of the products in the marketplace today, and I don't care whether you're talking iOS or Android or, you know, some of the other, the Windows phones, I know there's still a few of those out there, or any of these other operating environments. I know there's some some other smaller ones that may be a bigger player in other markets. But we have these devices that are very capable now. In the beginning, like I said, the, it was about pushing the data, but what's happened now is these phones have started to integrate various meteorological sensors in them from barometers to thermometers to hygrometers so if, you know measuring humidity as well but what's kind of interesting is we've seen more recently we're also taking a little bit of a step back from how much of the sensors are on there as the you know people are trying to make these phones more I don't know, waterproof in some cases, which limits what kind of sensors you can have. But in any case, so, but, but almost all of them still have at least a barometer in their ability to measure pressure. So we, we definitely have devices that can do it. They, they're definitely handheld, right? But along with that has been certainly a whole other slew of things that's taken place around the technology. So we've got this piece of hardware. Certainly it has the apps on it that can... Still, it's, those sensors need to be there for them to be useful. But we've had this other kind of phase that I, I think has gone on, this crowdsourcing phase. And really, that's taken you know, a couple different routes as it relates to weather-type data, if you will. So we've seen things from Kickstarter. I don't, I don't know if any of you have ever supported a Kickstarter project or a Indiegogo. I've done one of each. And I will tell you, the, both of the projects I supported ultimately got created. However, they took, of course, longer, I think, than, than their original schedule. I'm happy that I got the end product or whatever. But the goals and all the things they had to work through certainly weren't within the, the time frame that they originally they laid out. But... There, there was an interesting Kickstarter when it comes to meteorology, and you've heard me mention the app Dark Sky before back when I did reviews on uh, precipitation and radar apps. And while it's not personally one of my favorite apps, that's where it got its start was on Kickstarter. And what they were trying to do and what they've continued to do, again, is focus on this very localized type of forecast, but utilizing data from your phone, essentially where you are, more than meteorological data, just where you are and matching that compared to what the real-time data that they're getting from, whether it's a radar source or a weather model, what that information is saying. The other side of the, the I guess, the crowdsourcing component that we have is just the people element, right? So probably even what made me start thinking about this episode to begin with was not this most recent AMS meeting, but the one last year, 
right before I started doing this podcast, I was in New Orleans, and I heard um, a person speak. Her name is Julia Lestage, and she had started something called Weather Mob. Now, this was the other type of crowdsourcing that you hear about a lot. So some of it is about funding, but this is just about providing information. And this program took input, and specifically one of the, the cases she went through was this idea of um, – the blossoms in Japan, which Japan follows, you know, as it goes from north to south, they were able to very accurately predict when different areas in Japan were going to have their big spring bloom. And that was achieved through all the data that the different users were providing. Now, those were a couple of successful things. She actually had sold the business by the time she was presenting it at the AMS meeting. However, I've also seen some other ones, some that have tried to crowdsource data, um, some of which some scientists wanted to use. So we've had this, like I said, this whole sort of crowdsourcing era go, go on, and whether that's financial and helping develop new apps and new ways to tweak the weather forecast that we're getting on our devices, or if, if again, it's kind of doing the flip of that. So crowdsourcing the type of data that might be used to provide some sort of weather-related forecast. Now, the weather mob was, you know, and I've seen some other products that are even still out there today, like I said, some better than others, that are focused on you getting a forecast based on what other people are seeing around you. And, and, and it's very helpful, I guess, when you're getting into very short-range situations. The real question would be, of course, is what kind of value does that sort of forecast have beyond the next couple hours? And for some people, that may be all that matters. So there's certainly the potential there. Now, we have, again, crowdsourcing serving two ways, one to help the innovation, one to help in the data collection. But what does all this mean in terms of what we can do with it, right? And so this gets into, you know, research that I looked at and seeing what what people were talking about and interestingly enough most of the articles I found on this topic there haven't been as much in the last year so this was a hot topic around the time of of the meeting last year that I went to and even a few years before that and you know I, some some classic sources that I've seen here Angela Fritz at the Capital Weather Gang and you've certainly heard me mention her work before and she did an article on this very topic and I think it was in 2014 actually uh, and she talked about it from a capability that they had studied. And this was very interesting to use the mobile networks, but not so much the phones as it was the tower communication from one t tower to the next to be able to understand when rain was going through an area. And they could tell it based on how the signal was impacted. But as she brought up in her own article, the idea, you know, I mentioned this idea of, of weather mob when, when data is going in or, or some others that I've looked at. The challenge of using data from all these individual phones, and this is really where the potential might be, right? You know, I mentioned all these sensors, all these capabilities, but is that data really useful? And, you know, the premise brought up in the article or the idea that was conveyed through someone she talked to was maybe not so much. Now, Certainly, that's not the only article on this. I read some others in, in Mashable where it talked about weather news and what they're doing. Now, weather news was the one that bought this weather mob company. So um, Julie Lestage, who I heard speak, was purchased by weather news and some of the things they're trying to do. And they're, again, they're thinking about this, which is how do all these phones help when I've got them out and about? What can we do with all that information? And another article that I saw in Wired Magazine referred to the work of Cliff Mass. Some of you may know him. Cliff does a, a popular kind of weather blog, and he's up in the Seattle area and does work at the University of Washington there. So different people from scientific to commercial looking at how we might be able to if it's, you know, like I said, the dark sky is focused on this hyperlocal forecast, but just generally speaking, how we might be able to best integrate both, both ends of that communication channel and the value on each end. So in other words, using where the, maybe where the, 
the user is that has the device and tweaking the forecast accordingly, but also using what that device is telling us about where that individual is and sending it back to be churned over and maybe incorporated in a model. And, and Cliff Mass actually has a graduate student. And I will put a couple of links in the show notes that get into that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But again, the idea, I, I don't know, I really, some of the earlier articles, 2012, 2013 were probably some of the early ones, but 2014, 2015, it really started peaking and what people were talking about. And like I said, in the last 12 months, I'm not seeing as much. And let's talk a little bit about why that might be. Now, I think I've mentioned on the podcast before, right? You know, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit of a weather nerd, big surprise there, but I have this, this watch that I have and it's kind of an outdoorsy watch, you know, it's got a compass on it, that sort of thing. But really why I bought it was, it was a weather watch, right? And it had barometer and temperature capability. But one of the things, or one of the problems with that watch is if you keep it on your wrist and this gets into some, some very scientifically ordered oriented things you know we have these relationships that happen in the atmosphere and one of them is related to temperature and pressure and you, know, you change one and it's going to impact the other now it's not quite as straightforward as that but generally speaking that's what's going on and, and this watch has a bias because of that problem so if you put it on your wrist they tell you that the temperature and pressure readings are going to be off because the proximity to your skin means that the temperature sensor and pressure sensor information is not going to be as accurate as it would be if it was just sitting on a neutral surface. And so they even tell you, you know, if you really want to get accurate readings, let it sit off your arm for a period of time. Now you would think that might defeat the whole purpose of having it. And to some extent it does if you're trying to get that information on the go. But you know, when you're out and about, it's not that hard to do that. So Still has some value, but again, it highlights some of the limitations. As I mentioned earlier, we've also gotten this challenge with as we're trying to make the phones more durable, I guess is the best way. And you know, some of this is about dropping your phones, and s- but some of it is about this waterproofing, and it's become a big trend in the past couple of years. And that's actually meant that the sensors that the manufacturers were putting in these devices, they've started taking some of those sensors out. Now, the one exception of that does seem to be the barometer, and they figured out a way, in most cases, and I even did some testing with this, of the barometer in, you know, my Samsung phone, I mentioned this kind of temperature pressure relation, and so the only way to make sure that you're doing it right is you really just want pressure changed by really what's going on in the atmosphere around you, or or by elevation changes. Both of those things should change it. But I was curious how my phone would do if I changed it. So I literally put my phone in the freezer for a period of time to see if it had any impact with no other changes going on. And it didn't. So it seems like they have isolated the barometer well enough that it can give an accurate reading, even if it's in a situation where it might be experiencing some, some temperature changes that could for instance, with my watch, that would certainly impact the value that it gives me in the, in the pressure reading. So it's good to see that the sensors, and, and this is not surprising, my watch is 10 years old or whatever it is now, but it's good to see that they've got these sensors. And I you know, I read some articles even when I was doing some research for, for this episode about how the sensors have evolved and all the advances they've made. And you know, again, they're trying to make these things smaller and smaller. It's always amazing to me what they can do and something that used to have to sit up when they first started doing barometers and things and having them on ships and move around and all the, how big they were and how micro everything has gotten. And this is just another reminder to me about how small these things have gotten. So that was kind of neat. In any case, I digress a little bit. But waterproofing still allows for that barometer, but it has taken away these other things. So t- to some sense, and this is one of the things, one of the apps, and I'm not going to mention it, This one of these kind of crowdsourcing apps, it guesses the temperature not based on, the rela- on a relationship between the pressure because it doesn't have an actual temperature sensor. It does it based on the temperature sensor of the battery and tries to extrapolate, and then it maps it out. And all I could tell you was I went to the website, and the forecasts were horrible. I mean, it was forecasting temperatures that were 20 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, so not quite, a little over 10 degrees Celsius off. Okay, just off. I mean, it was horrible. So 
I think they were in a better situation when the manufacturers were putting more sensors in. But like I said, with this trend towards waterproofing or you know keeping dust out of ports and those sort of things, that's a sensor that's gone away. And so their attempt to interpret hasn't worked out as well. The other challenge we have with these, and you know, one of the companies that I was talking about that's looking into it was a way to have your camera essentially take pictures of the sky. And from that, they would determine cloud cover and those sort of things. And again, the idea is neat, right? The concept of doing that is neat. The question would be, is that a value? Now, we've also got this fundamental problem that most most of the Earth's covered by water, right? Most of the people that are out there doing stuff with their cell phones aren't over the oceans. However, that said, I will say that having better coverage over land in terms of weather monitoring would be useful. I've mentioned in a previous episode, for instance, the company that was swallowed up by IBM, that's now essentially IBM Weather, if you will, they've done projects and are doing projects with countries. You've also heard me mention Weatherbugger or Earth Networks, who put sensors all over, particularly with lightning as well, um, all over the U.S. in particular, but they have them throughout the globe. And, And that's more of what's happening is it's getting easier to get relatively good stationary locations and enough of them that you you run into this thing is do you really need the sense the the cell phone or mobile phone to be that sensor when you could spend a few hundred dollars have it at a fixed location know it's going to be there power it by a, a simple solar panel i know that you know my davis vantage pro or whatever the battery lasted for years even with just a, a simple cell phone charger so it, it not a cell phone charger with a solar panel charger so it's reasonable if we go that route to get some of these stations and i've read articles about remote locations now that it, it's easier just to put these all on solar that you can put a station out there yeah again you do run into these things of of potential theft or you know wildlife knocking things over that sort of thing or some other natural disaster impacting a station and losing that station. However, on the flip side of that is, do you benefit really from all these phones moving around? And that's, that's really what it, it boils down to now still won't solve the ocean problem, but the benefit we have with the ocean problem is things over the ocean aren't as readily changing as they are over land. The warming that we experience every day in land masses, just it doesn't happen in the same ways over the ocean. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen in the same way. So the sensors over land is probably more important. But still, it would be nice if in some way we could have sensors distributed over ocean areas as well. And I mean, as an example, when we have hurricanes here in the North Atlantic Basin, they will go out and do extra sensor launches to cover that grid, to provide more data for that very reason. Now, as I mentioned, you know, if we, if we take all this stuff and, and think about it for a moment and say, well, is anybody really getting anywhere with this? You know, have, what are people doing? What are people trying? I've mentioned Dark Sky. One of the things that Dark Sky is trying to do now is they're, they are trying to incorporate data from the phone. I don't know how far they are. This, this is the thing. I re, like I said, I read all these articles, but then I came out of it, and it, I, I'm not. It's not real clear how far anybody's really gotten. It makes me wonder that whether it's Dark Sky, Weather Mom, I mentioned a program called Sunshine that swallowed up another one. Um, Cliff Mass, who I mentioned, he actually, and I'll put a link to his. He's trying to do this pre- pressure thing, and he's created an app. I mean, it, so he's at least trying to entice you with with this. Please give us pressure information off your phone. In return, we'll give you an app that gives you a forecast and everything. So at least there's there's some reasonable trade-off there. And I'm actually testing that one now. And it was, of all the ones I looked at that were trying to incorporate stuff from my end, it was one of the better ones I saw. So again, check in the show notes. But will these people get anywhere? You know, Cliff, Cliff Mass's re- grad student may have found that the results were positive that by having this data, they could enhance at least the short range localized forecast. But what happens in 
a theoretical scientific environment versus trying to do something real time. It's always you know two different things. And I will tell you in the end, we, we've got some real challenges to wh- whether any of this will ever really happen. Now, first off, there's certainly potential. Having more in situ measurements, and all that means is in-person measurements. You know, you've heard me mention weather balloons as examples. One of the few ways we get upper air readings that are actually measured at that location. You know, so much of what we do is we're, we infer it from other ways or get it from satellite data. But those have real problems. I also mentioned pl- people like Earth Networks or, you know, the IBM weather folks that are putting devices in, in new places around the globe that hadn't traditionally had them. We leverage these simple ideas of atmospheric science, like I was telling you, the pressure temperature relationship, whether it's, you know, we call it the ideal gas law or something like the hypsometric equation. Don't don't get hung up in the names, but there are some very fundamental relationships with just understanding something as simple as the pressure changes that are going on around us that they can be very useful. Now, the reality is, though, it's most likely to tweak the short-term forecast and most likely to be very localized in how it's going to help you. But end of day, end of day with all these things, we're still going to run in the challenge of the quality of the data. So let, let's assume for a moment we're just looking just at pressure, right? But for it to be any good, you need to know that that person is not 30 floors up in a building and that their device is good enough that it's not changing if it's sitting in the pocket that the pressure is still accurate and that they're out and about, that they're outside, like I said. Now, you, you think about it. Google Maps, you put it on there, right? You, they always say that the whole problem with, with the phones is they don't necessarily, the height or the elevation can be off as much as 60 feet. And that actually measures for pressure and pressure readings and what we would be trying to do. But if you have good mapping, we already know the elevation. So I, you know, I would start by discarding anybody that's inside or any phone that's inside just immediately it's just it's not worth trying to do the quality control on that again we we have more computers than ever before but if you flood people with data the time spent wasted trying to figure out that sort of information could be very tricky so is there potential is there potential i do think that the pressure data could be useful i think we've got to get past the quality control piece i think we got to know you know very accurately where that device is and understand the sensor limitations, but all those are those are achievable things. But end of day, what I don't know is will people really care whether their forecast is that much more accurate? I don't know. That's one of the, the struggles I always have with forecasting in general is only in very specific situations are people that worried about whether it's going to rain at 3 o'clock versus 4 o'clock. Now, for me it matters, and for some people it does, but whether people are willing to give their data, and this is the other challenge. We're kind of in this day and age where people are becoming a little more antsy when they think about more and more about how much data they're sharing is will people want to do that and be willing to do that because you hear stories, well, it's, it's anonymized and it's safe, and then you hear stories about, well, maybe it's not. So I think there's real opportunity I also wonder at some point if we get more of these, you know, kind of regular weather stations out and about over land, if that might not be a better approach instead of trying to worry about tweaking everybody. You know, maybe the better option is everybody has a weather station in their home that can be calibrated and it's in the same place and you know what the, the challenges are that you're dealing with with that device. I mean, Weather Underground's been doing that for ages, right? They have all these personal weather stations that are mapped out all over the place that belong to us Joe citizens. So the idea is there. There are things to try. But end of day, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that our smartphones, at least in the short term, are going to have all that big of a change on the weather forecast you see on that device itself. So, find a good app for your forecast I think is probably more important all right wow I ran a little long you know me tech and weather that that happens so I won't keep you too much longer 
The interesting tidbit I came across this week had to do with snow removal. And I don't know why this or I think it may have been in some feed I get with, you know, kind of weather news. Fourteen plus billion dollars annually in the U.S. for snow removal. But there's over one hundred and twenty five thousand what they called. I forget what the word was they used organizations doing the removal. Now, I'm not sure how this works in other parts of the world, whether you know it's done by the local governments or not. But here in the U.S., most of it is private enterprise. And I know when I lived in Syracuse, I mean, we contracted with somebody, and he came and plowed our driveway if it snowed. And you just paid a fee. But they were talking about you know companies trying to deal with paying for a whole year and then it doesn't turn out in the snow and all this stuff. But it was, I was amazed someone did an article on this stuff, but 14 billion is a big number, U.S. dollars, I know, but 14 billion. But the fact that there were 125,000 organizations providing this service around the world, which tells you how many, what we would call single shingle folks are out there doing it. All right. Well, let's let you run as you know how to get hold. What is it about the weather at gmail.com or what is it about the weather.com either place. And you can get information about current episodes, past episodes, how to support us. You know that drill, RSVP, rate, share, validate, and pledge. Check us out. Follow us. All those good things. Check the show notes if you were interested in any of the topics we talked about. Next time, I think I'm going to hit on social media. I, I hope to have that be able to do that episode next week. There's some things coming up that might tweak that. And then I still have the shutter disaster <laughs> for the end of the month. But until next time, may you have interesting, enjoyable, but of course, intertwined weather. Because as we all know, there's much more to weather than the weather itself.